Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, along with the 70 elders of Israel, they went up the mountain, and there they saw God. And under his feet, bright and blue as the sky, was a pavement made out of lapis lazuli. That's just fun to say. Under his feet. Did you catch that? And it wasn't just, you know, a far distant peak. What, is that God? I don't know, it's too far to tell. No, they were up close and personal. So personal that they sat at his table. And they ate and they drank. What did that food taste like? What kind of wine were they drinking? Or whatever beverage was there? Well, who served them? Who cleaned up? I mean, so many questions. But the biggest... It was a known fact that no one could see God and live. Not His full glory. So how did they come into His presence? Well, somehow, and I know we're not told, but somehow... God humbled himself to a form that was able to attend a dinner party and enjoy a meal and fine conversation. It's not that unusual. This is repeated again in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. At the very end, when this, this old world passes away and the new earth is brought in by Jesus, our King, and his second and final coming, and there God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, will be with us, you and me, and all who have gone before us. And there will be a family meal, and it will be a spread on that table, and what that food will taste like, oh man, and there will be wine. And there will be nobody getting drunk, okay? And it will be wonderful and amazing, and the thing is, it's not going to end. This meal on the mountain with Moses, it ended. Do you know what happened next? After this heaven come down to earth, God and his people party, do you know what happened? Well, if you kept on reading from Exodus chapter 24, you would find that this 40 days and 40 nights that God had Moses entertained on that mountain was just far too long for the people to wait. And, and they told one another that, you know, we don't know what happened to Moses. And, and, and this is what they told themselves, this absence Circumstantial absence, this is what it means. It means God really doesn't love us. We're really not his tight-knit family that would have a meal with him. We're all alone, and we need to do something about this. Now, if you tell yourself that God has abandoned me, we're all alone in the universe, God doesn't care about me, we're going to have to do something. If that's what you say in your heart and in your soul, what kind of feelings do those thoughts typically produce, right? Despair, depressed, awful. What kind of behaviors then normally follow from those kind of feelings and thoughts? Good or bad? Yeah, you know, it's bad. And see, it just didn't matter if they had told themselves the truth or a lie. That, that did not matter. It was just the content of what they said. And here's then what they did. They gathered around Aaron. And they said, hey, we don't know what happened to Moses. Oh, make gods for us to go before us. Aaron listened to them. And he made a golden calf. To be their God. And the people, how did they feel? They felt good. Because that's what they told themselves the circumstances meant before them. They didn't have a God, now they have a God. Life's good. In fact, it was so good they thought, let's throw a party. You know, like that God party on the mountain we heard about from Nadab and Abihu. We'll throw a party for our God. And it was big and it was wonderful and it was awesome. But it was, wait a minute. Think of think what was really going on and how truly ugly and icky it was. God himself 
had brought these people so close to himself in an intimate connection in which he would be vulnerable. He would be known and accessible to them where they could actually be that close and not be destroyed. He did not raise his hand against them. And within a month and a half, they've abandoned ship and they've made their own God and they're worshiping it. How does that happen? Why do we follow a very similar pattern? Where we can feel so close, so intimate with God, and then not that much later feel ambivalent, alone, and then just go about our own way and do our own thing. Well, I know we don't make a golden calf, but we do put our hope and our trust in something other than God, our delights, our time and, and passions. Why does that happen? How does it happen? Well, I can tell you that one. I can tell you how it happens. This is how it happens. It's what you listen to or who you listen to determines two things in every human. How you feel and what you do. Who you listen to determines your feelings and your behavior. Here's what I mean. If you tell yourself, you know, if it's a beautiful day, it's 74 degrees and sunny, and you tell yourself, well, I can't be happy unless, you know, it's that temperature. And you know what? My, my spouse needs to be a certain level of, of happy and pleasant to be around. And, and my job needs to be a certain level of, of you know, meaning and purpose. And, and, and customers need to be, you know, reasonable. And, 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 and if you tell yourself, if the circumstances are not this way, I can't be happy, well, what kind of feelings are you going to have? Your feelings are always and only set by what you tell yourself. Now be careful, because they're not set by the circumstances themselves. You and I think, oh, it's a cold day today. We've been having like 70, 80 degrees, and now it's cold. It's terrible. Circumstances do not determine your feelings or your behavior. But what you tell yourself, the change in the weather means... So what we tell ourselves then is all important. And if you have to have all of the stars aligned before you can tell yourself it's going to be good, then what kind of emotions will you typically have? You know, and if, when you have your big, bag, ugly emotions, what do you normally do to your family, your friends? What kind of prayers do you raise up to God? or any prayers at all? What kind of coping mechanisms and self-medications do you apply to your feelings? And, you know, in the desert, they had a drunken orgy. And it's kind of typical that those two things rise to the top of our list of self-medications, alcohol and sex. But it's not just that we listen to ourselves say, well, this is what circumstance means. We also listen to a couple other sources of information. We also listen to ourselves. And when I say ourselves, I mean the darker part of ourselves, that part that the Bible describes as your flesh. And here's what it says. It says, you deserve better. You deserve better than what you're getting. Don't put up with that attitude. You deserve better than what you're getting at home, at work. And so, use your power of your words, your hands, your sex appeal, your whining, whatever you got. Use it to get what you want. Now, if you're listening to that source of information that you deserve better, what kind of feelings of jealousy, malice, rage? Yeah. But that's... I said, oh, there's one other source that we listen to. And, and some of you might think, really? Yeah, really. And that's the devil. What? I know, there's no devil on my shoulder telling me to do this or that. He doesn't have to because he uses what's normal in the culture. He uses what's legal. Everybody does this. It's an acceptable thing to do. 
And then he comes alongside all of the things that, you know, you're telling yourself about the circumstances and, and what your sinful flesh is demanding that you take. And he suggests a way that's reasonable and, and you can do this. And it is tempting. And when you do take the bait, you know what? His name means, the devil means the accuser, Diabolos. So once you've taken the bait, he comes in like a ton of bricks saying, Oh, you're guilty. You're a horrible person. How could God ever forgive you from what you've done? You are beyond his love. I mean, it's, it's diabolical. Tempts you to sin and then crushes you with guilt for doing it. Yet these three sources, the, the circumstances of the world, what we're telling ourselves, and, and our own sinful flesh and the devil, the Bible describes these sources of information as our enemies. And the dead set against your relationship with God and have a strategic plan to divide you and God into separate pieces places. Of course, these enemies cannot take you away from God. They don't have that kind of power. Instead, here's the power that they have. They have the power to diminish, destroy, and ruin your peace and your joy in being with God. If your peace and your joy is gone, then there's a chance at least. It's an outside chance, but still a chance that they're willing to take that you on your own, like the people in the desert, It'll just be too long a wait if I don't have my peace and my joy and you yourself will walk away. And saying then to yourself, I've been abandoned by God. He doesn't really care about me. Not like a tight-knit family. I'm all alone in the universe. I need to take matters into my own hands. Stay with me. Jump ahead many, many years past Moses to another mountain which is climbed. Another encounter with God. And it was awesome. Peter, James, and John, right? And, 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 and they didn't know what to think about it, right? So Jesus said, well, how about we not talk about this until you kind of know what's going on? And then because this cloud just enveloped them and the voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Why those words? Listen to him. Well, the circumstances were going to become very dire for the disciples. They would soon see Jesus handed over and he would be tortured. He would be crucified, pierced with nails and thorns. And they would tell themselves, this is what the circumstances mean. It's all over. We are abandoned. We're all alone in the universe. We need to take things into our own hands. Soon, their sinful flesh will be crying out, Run! Flee! You deserve better than being tortured and crucified like Jesus. Soon, the Diabolos, the devil, will be accusing them of being worthless friends of Jesus. Faithless followers. More concerned about their own position and power than the person of Jesus. And they were... And the devil was right. Unless they listened to Jesus, they would have no hope. Unless we listen to Jesus. And as we listen to Jesus, we find that the circumstances of life that we have long sought to, to suck out all of the good and have it for ourselves, but it keeps slipping out of our fingers. We find that the good that we just want to have, it, it's in Jesus. He does not change. His love for you is constant. His goodness does not change from day to day like the weather. As you listen to Jesus, you find that everything that your flesh has been crying out that you deserve you see it for what it is. A golden calf that needs to be destroyed. 
Paul would write, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you and of the earth, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry, golden calves. As you listen to Jesus, you will find that even the devil is silenced once and for all. His accusations do not fall on you. But it happens in a very unusual way. Because everything the devil has said about you or will say to you about how awful and rotten and sinful you are, Jesus agrees. He says, yeah, they are, sin they are rotten and sinful. But hear Jesus from the cross. Father, forgive them. And at the resurrection, the Father answers, Yes, yes, I forgive. And I draw them to myself. And I keep them in my strong, unshakable kingdom. And I open my heart to an intimate love that cannot be taken. Yes. This is the life of the follower of Jesus right now. An intimate, close life with God. And because that is true now, a day is coming when each and every one of us will climb one last mountain, a mountain of God, and there we shall see Him face to face. And a table will be spread, and we will eat, and we will drink, and never again will there be a tear, or sorrow, or sadness. That's the life of being with God. And to live this life, I have a sermon take home, which it's, it's a practice, it, in which you're going to take each and every one of the, the enemies and ask yourself this week, well, what am I telling myself the circumstances mean? You're going to write them down. This takes thought. You can't just pass. You, you have to think and pray, what am I telling myself? And then what demand is my sinful flesh crying out for satisfaction? And then what is tempting me or filling my heart with condemnation? You write those out because those are the enemy's words. And then the prayer, Jesus, you alone are my Savior and teacher. Train my heart to listen to you only. Put to death what is earthly in me and lead me ever closer in love, forgiveness, peace, and joy. Amen.